1966, another uh, round the world trip with Project Magnet, going west. We left Andrews, or it's out of Washington, to Alameda, which is across the bay from San Francisco. From there to Pango Pango, or to Hickam, Hawaii. And then from Hawaii to Pango Pango in American Samoa. And we landed and noticed that there was a lot of commotion around the airfield there. So we asked to see what the hell is going on. Well, the president's coming. And so evidently, LBJ was on his way to Saigon. He was president then. And uh, I was due to land the refuel in Pango Pango. And when he was there, he was going to dedicate a new school in the local town. And this wasn't much of a town. It wasn't much of an air airfield. It wasn't much of an island. So sure enough, about two hours after he landed, in came Air Force One, uh, it was a 707 then, and uh, down the, the steps came LBJ and his entourage of press people and stuff. But there were, it was no big old security thing. I have a photograph of him. I was about 20 feet away. LBJ in the back of some old Chevy convertible they took around. The town, they went to that school and dedicated the school, flew back or drove back to the airport and two hours later took off. So I got to see LBJ to totally unexpected and with no security obviously around. I could have got there and smacked him on a snuggle. I wanted to. So my experience in Pango Pango. Meeting the president. I didn't really meet him, I just saw him close. Oh. So we have a So we have a postcard for that. Where did I go from there? Pango, 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 Pango to Auckland. Oh, Auckland, New Zealand. See if yes. On the North Island. Very nice town. This hotel we're staying at. We're down for breakfast the next morning. And lo and behold, it, there's only about three people in the dining room for breakfast. It was on a weekday, I think. And sitting about three tables away by himself. Arnold Palmer, who was in, in town for some golf tournament with him. So my second celebrity within uh, two or three days. From Auckland, I went to uh, Christchurch, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, Christchurch, because that was a dropping off place for a flight down to Antarctica. Spent a few days in Christchurch. Oh, one of the interesting things about New Zealand, they still have the uh, leftover laws from, uh, this was 1967, right? 66. Six. Leftover World War II laws from uh, when we were uh, afraid of a Japanese air attack. They had uh, lights out curfew at 6.30. And so there was the uh, in the bars, there was they still closed at 6:30. No booze. They kept the the, the 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 booze laws, but they still had the lights on and all that kind of stuff. You know, back to normal, except in their prudish English way, English Protestant way, had no booze after 6:30 in the afternoon, because that was part of the uh, blackout procedure from World War II. So you're in there having a drink. And next thing you know, it's called a squirrel. They serve beer out of a, like a garden hose attachment to the, uh, instead of a beer tap, it was a hose tap. And the bartender were up and down the, the bar with a garden hose, kind of a, a, a trigger, you know, that garden hose has a sort of trigger thing. He would fill your mug on, on the, as you were stand, sitting in your chair. So it was, Sort of a kind of a mobile beer tap. It was a wild dash to make it by 6:30. The to McMurdo, McMurdo uh, Station, Williamsfield, on the Rice Ice Shelf, it was a, a landing field uh, actually on on the ice. I had been trained uh, 
or uh, polar navigation, which is a polar navigation school of paraphilies, because you can't use normal charts and magnetic compass and all that stuff. As you get close to magnetic pole, because the compass becomes uh, unusable, a magnetic compass. We use a gyro compass and some kind of a different grid to, uh, to fly around. And that's why I went and uh, we took a side trip to uh, this hut that's uh, in this photograph here, where I took the picture of uh, Robert uh, Scott's base camp from, uh, I think he was there from 19, uh, 1906 through 1912, our trips. It was abandoned after he died. I was returned from the pole in 1912. And we were the first people that led into that. Uh, it was like nobody used to go one or other, I guess. This was 1960, was it 66? 66. 66. Yeah. And I picked up that rock and carried it all the way home. I still have it. My souvenir from Antarctica. It's a piece of basalt, I think. A white. And it's heavy as hell. But I picked that up. Another th interesting thing about that, there was a, a horse carcass. One of the horses that he had used Oops. in 1912. And it was, uh, I think you can see the, the, the area it was. It wasn't recognized as a horse anymore. But it was definitely out. Yeah, like right in the center, mm -hmm. right around there somewhere, that pile. It was the remains of a Siberian pony that had died and they just left it. No, not that big. That right there where your finger is now. Mm -hmm. Snow covered pile of crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the. Re it was bones and and fur when I saw it. But it's so cold down there. It was just. Preserved in the United States of 1912. Our, uh, the scientists and our crew were let into the building and they actually opened some of the boxes of crackers and ate those crackers. And they had maybe photograph photographers there who took photographs. We got some copies and took them with us back to Perth, Australia. And uh, they made the papers. We were big, big time celebrities when we got to uh, Perth, Australia. We also flew the first flight ever from Antarctica to Perth. It wasn't such a big deal, it was just nobody else wanted to do it ever. We, uh, we flew the first, uh, first flight. I think it took 15 hours over open water all the way. That was the flight where we uh, were heading down towards the South Pole. From McMurdo, and uh, one of the uh, starboard engines went bad, and uh, it was kind of a tight situation because the ground is 10,000 feet high. So in order to just stop from hitting the ground, he had to maintain 10,000 feet elevation, and we're pretty heavily loaded. So uh, the pilot asked me to get a course to the nearest low spot so they could drop altitude fast. And that was out of, back over water. It took us about three hours to get there. But we got to, uh, so we could drop down to about sea level and flew back to the uh, McMurdo on three inches. So we didn't actually make it to the pole, a few, a few hundred miles short, before the engine went bad. And we, uh, the crew, the crew chief, the enlisted guy, Went out and you know, they inspected the engines as soon as we got back. They said that all was well. And so we flew that next day to uh, to Perth. And then when we landed at Perth, they looked at the engines and said they were needed replacement. So I know those engines were bad when we were at McMurdo. They just didn't want to spend two weeks waiting them for a if that for a, a replacement engine to be flown in. As it was, we spent uh, 11 days in beautiful, sunny Perth, Australia for two weeks 
waiting for the engine to be sent back, sent to us and replaced. That's a 16.7 hour trip from McMurdo to Perth, oh, yes. to the bad engines. Well, it wasn't notably bad, it, it kept going. But they did, when we landed, they, uh, they found iron filings in the oil filters, which indicated that someone had been ground up in the engine. We just burned a lot of oil. To Singapore, right, we stayed in the Raffles Hotel, a famous colonial era British hotel with overhead fans, no air conditioning. The fans were run by a central motor with electric, I mean, uh, leather straps and pulleys all through the, uh, the ceiling of the, uh, they were exposed to the ceiling of the lobby. And the, uh, the bar, the waiters were like Indian outfits with their high collar, white outfits on serving you your warm beer and pink gin as they call it there. What is pink gin? Pink gin is beer and bitter, or gin and bitters. Oh. Famous English, popular English drink of the, of the colonial era. Bangkok, I don't remember much about Bangkok other than they had canals instead of streets. The Venice of the Orient. Or oh, the crew set me up for a one time they were out to uh to lunch and they all ordered this pea soup. Well soup it had these things that looked like peas floating around it. And I bit into one of those peas and it was the hottest, hottest sp burning spice I have ever eaten in my life. Talk about being set up. They, they got me, and they got, all got a big laugh on old naive Hogarth biting into the old hot fruit. And that's all I remember from saying, oh, the, um, it was all, I say it was all canals instead of streets. And they had these canoes, that, like instead of taxis, with these huge V8 engines with a long propeller shaft sticking out the back and an exposed propeller on it. I've ever seen a James Bond movie. One of the chase scenes was using these uh, water, canal water taxis, these big V8 engines. And they're just a big canoe with a big monstrous engine. Quite a lot of fun. And those canals were not the uh, pristine, clear water that you might think it was. Uh, not only was the water transportation, it was also the public sewer, I think. And uh, what, one of the things I note about most of the tropical cities I've been to, Saigon, Bangkok, Singapore, Abidjan in Africa, Recife, Brazil, and uh, Guayaquil, Ecuador, they all have this characteristic smell. If they're equatorial tropical cities, it's, they're very hot, very humid, and any living matter, well, former living matter, animal or plant, instantly rots. And like a d discarded banana peel, or just normal garbage, it instantly starts to smell putrid, and the entire city smells like that. When as soon as you walk out the plane, it hits you right in the face, and say, man, I'm, in a tropical city right now, it's hot, sweaty, and stinks. Saigon's the same way. Boy, the, the one exception to this equatorial uh, stinky city was uh, Nairobi, Kenya, which is right down the almost equator in Africa, but it's at such a high elevation, it uh, has climate very similar to San Francisco. And it's not down the coastline either. And that was, a at that time, a beautiful, clean city when it was, uh, they just had got their independence in, uh, in the mid-60s when I was there. But right smack on the equator. So when we get to, uh, in my logbook chronology, I get to Nairobi. I have some interesting stories to tell you about that town, too. Here's one. 
I don't know if we thoroughly did Auckland, New Zealand. Yes, that's where I met Arnold Palmer. Right, here's the picture. Auckland, New Zealand. Auckland, New Zealand, they, uh, right outside the hotel there was a, a town park on a hill full of grass and they had uh, sheep just grazing on in the park. Sheep everywhere in New Zealand. And I guess it's there, like we have beef, they have uh, mutton. One thing I always wanted to eat, but I never have, is mutton, mature sheep. I like lamb, but I never have mutton. So if anybody ever comes across a mutton, I'm ready to be served. Are we still recording? Yeah. Oh. Oh, you're going to edit this to take out the the dead air. Right. You have a back alley here of uh, Perth. Bath, back back alley. alley of Perth? Perth. Perth, Australia. Don't remember any back alleys there. Another uh, coastal city, but very much like San Francisco. It's on the west coast of Australia and has the same climate as San Francisco. Sort of mid 60s, 70s. Well, you make the same comment back here at uh, New Zealand that something is very much like um, Auckland. New Zealand. Yeah, Auckland was very nice. Climate nice. like San Francisco. San Francisco. San Francisco is my benchmark for yeah. for a beautiful climate, beautiful cities. If I had any any preference, a place to live, I would live in San Francisco or something similar. Berkeley was nice too. Here's a one from uh, McMurdo, exterior view of, you have a crossed off, Eights Station, and then you say Williams Field. Right? Yeah, the field down there, actually not a field, it's a hunk of ice, oh. Ross Ice Shelf on Ross, Ross Bay, I guess, yeah, Mc McMurdo Sound. There's a postcard here with a great big log, and it said this log, located near the restaurant in Kings Park, was brought to Perth from Pemberton, where kari trees grow to a height of 250 feet or more. The specimen is calculated to be 100 feet long, 24 I don't really care about the log. No? Why did it you was just a, just a postcard, just a postcard that was sitting there and I picked up and bought it and sent it home. It says quite a toothpick. Quite a toothpick. Yes. I don't remember it. Okay. When I was in Perth, I didn't stay with the crew downtown because they were just too much drinking and hell raising. I had enough of that, so I, on my own, moved out to a, Here's an a beach, a beachfront hotel. Scarborough Beach near Perth. You guys want to hear me? And there are people lined up. So much for my, so much for my interview. I was just, I was just giving an interesting anecdote. I lost my train of thought. Oh God. He said he didn't stay with the crew, he moved out to well, the beach, that. and that's the beach. But you interrupted the, the entire dis But look at people discourse. are lined up here like, on the, like a thing, like sardines. Do you want, do you want to take the mic here? Do you, want, do you want to take the mic? I don't care. <laughs> no. Did you see this? Why? These people that's are lined up split. like sardines. Lined up like sardines. On like a tray. On a tray. <laughs> Do I care? I guess I have to care. What the hell is going on? They look like solar reflectors, but they're really like nets, and they have four or five people stacked up on them. Did you see that? Those are fast rooms, Mom. Those are shelters so you don't get burned by the sun. What the hell was that all about? I have no idea what's going on here. I'm lost now. She's okay. been lost since she was born. Overlooking the city, King Park Restaurant, Perth, Western Australia. Leaving tonight on week delay. Well, one, I, in Perth there was in the phone book, I always look up in the phone book for Hogarth. And I did find a couple Hogarths. And uh, 
I think I had to rent a car then. I drove out to the Hogarth residence in the suburbs of Perth, but there was nobody home. So I tried to meet some of the long lost relatives. I think I have a, a photograph of the mailbox with Hogarth on it from that visit. Same we're going by the we're going by the logbook, okay. not the postcards. Okay. Because I didn't send the postcards from every place, nor did I take a photograph of every place I was at. So it's not.